Okay, this is the pre-roll for the Friday Night Bible Study for the 10th day of November. We're going live on Sabbath.tv first, and then we'll add Facebook Live a few seconds after that. And what's this? Okay. All right, all right, we're coming. We're coming. Some of you are wondering where I am. Here we come. All right, first of all, the button for greetings to those of you watching on Sabbath.tv. We're going to bring in the Facebook Live uh, people. And greetings to those of you watching on Facebook Live for this Friday night Bible study for the 10th day of uh, November 2017. It is the 22nd day of the 8th month on God's Hebrew calendar. This week during World Watch, I promised that we would be showing the World Tomorrow telecast that featured... Mr. Armstrong's visit to China. This is one of two. This one relates very much to what happened this week in news uh, with United States President Donald Trump spending time in China with China's President Xi Jinping. And I say it relates because God's end time apostle was, was there first. He was there before. Donald Trump got there. In fact, let's see, we're going back to 1981 for this telecast. So, what are we going back? 91, 2001, 2011, plus another six. 30 some, we're going back some 36 years. And, brethren, this has a lot of information in it that Mr. Armstrong gives that uh, is just chock full of things that are good for us to know about China and and interestingly how much China is in the news today and the fact that China will produce this 200 man army that uh, well let's see I meant to go over here on this side um, this 200 man army that's let's see if I can get that lower third out of the way I'm using different software tonight we go back and forth with 20 couple things while I'm trying to get both of them equal so I can really do a comparison and decide which one we're going to spend my money on for our night for our streams on both World Watch and Sabbath.tv I've been using different software all week now for Sabbath.tv I've got everything loaded for the channels we go on Sabbath.tv and this one so I came back to this software tonight but um here on the wall next to me, let's see, how do I bring that in tight? I think, uh, yeah, there we go. If you look at the column toward the, the your right side of the screen as you look at it, the one that has the number six at the top uh, of a pink bar, we're talking about the side that says the seventh seal equals seven trumpets. And then looking at the sixth trumpet, which is the same as the second woe, that's why it's got the two under the six in red on the pink bar. And just below that, if you can read that, you see it says 200 million army. That's talking about the 200 million men army. Where is that? I think that's Revelation 9, 6 is popping in my head, but that, that may not be right. Let me just take a fast look and see if that number in my head just happens to be it. Uh, try 16. Revelation 9, verse 16. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000,000, which means 200 million. And I heard the number of them, 200 million. And that's, I, I mentioned that in context with, you know, all the rest of this, friends, because very likely that 200 million man army is coming largely out of China, maybe mixed in with some of... Uh, some of uh, North Korea and that China likes to buddy up with and you know and who knows who else all right I'm gonna come back and I promised well I didn't promise I just said we'd probably or I said we'd <laughs> talk about the details of these two well, let me come back out here these two uh, beasts from Revelation 13 one from uh, over here on this side from the land and over here on this side from the ocean. The beast from the ocean is mentioned first in Revelation 13 and then about halfway through 
the chapter through Revelation 13, it starts talking about the beast from the land. I'm just checking myself real quick. Revelation 13 starts out saying, I stood upon the sand of the sea. Yeah, so that would be this beast over here from the ocean, from the sea. And saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. All right, we'll talk about that. And we'll go tight on these. Let me see, am I able to do that? I know I can get one of these. Yeah, we can we can go tight on this one. And, oh, I'm operating in preview. Okay, but it's, it worked anyway. Uh, we can go tight on this one. Let's get that lower third out of the way. And then we can zoom over to the other side of the room and go tight on this one. The beast from the land that's mentioned halfway through... Uh, chapter 13 when it gets to about verse 11 of revelation 13 it says and i beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and so we're going to talk about those two beasts after we hear mr armstrong so let's uh go ahead and put mr armstrong's lower third up on the screen he'll be speaking from 1981 in this telecast and it this telecast takes us to china so let's Let's go for that. The following is a special presentation of The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. One out of four people on Earth is a citizen of the People's Republic of China. Geographically, from the Western nations, they live half a world away. By any other standard, they are farther away than that. It was here that politics became religion, and a billion worshippers were assured that they could build heaven on earth. It was to the leadership of this nation that God opened the door for his apostle, Herbert W. Armstrong, to deliver the message that not even a billion minds and bodies could create utopia, but that it would nevertheless come to pass. Some time ago, the editor of a weekly news magazine in the United States said in an editorial that now our number one problem is that of survival of the human race. And he said it would seem now that the only hope that we have in the world would be the sudden intervention of a strong, unseen hand from someplace. Now, I have the pleasure to announce to you tonight, not to try to convince you, but to announce to you that what some of the leading scientists say is our only hope is going to happen, and that unseen hand is going to appear, and we are going to have world peace in our time. It was to one-fourth of the world's population that Herbert W. Armstrong took the most significant message of our time. This is an account of that historic visit to China, Inside the Wall. Along China's northern frontier, the garrisons and fortresses began appearing hundreds of years before the time of Christ. Gradually joined and expanded, over the centuries they became a monument of the ancient world, a monument to China's fear of and often disdain for foreigners. The Great Wall is a wonder of the ancient world, but its final stone was laid by a modern emperor. Mao Zedong saw himself leading a backward feudal land into the modern world. 
and he imagined China's revolution in the vanguard of a great and irresistible tide that would engulf the world. There are two winds in the world today, Chairman Mao once said, the east wind and the west wind. The east wind, he said, is prevailing. But something went wrong with the revolution. And instead of leading the world into a new era, China withdrew for nearly 30 years inside its wall. Now Chairman Mao is dead, and a west wind is blowing in China. For the first time in decades, China is looking beyond its walls for ideas and ideals. It is at this time in history that God has granted his servant favor in the eyes of the Chinese leadership. Herbert W. Armstrong arrived in Peking last December, the first Western religious leader invited to speak publicly in the People's Republic and to meet privately with Chinese leaders. His private plane was allowed to fly unescorted to Peking, a privilege rarely afforded visitors. An official greeting delegation met Mr. Armstrong and his party at the airport and escorted them to a welcoming dinner given by the Chinese Educational Society. To the Western world, China has always been a mystery. Its river valleys cradled a civilization, but a civilization that thrived in isolation from the Middle East and Europe, and which had a greatness all its own. For centuries, visitors found the Chinese tolerant of European ways, but scarcely interested in them. In the eyes of the Chinese, the world had little to offer the culture that produced paper, gunpowder, and Confucius. The mystery of China has endured to this day, but China's preeminent position among nations was forfeited with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. The decades of turmoil culminating in the triumph of the Communist Party in 1949 instilled a new spirit of change in China. Yet for most of the past 30 years, correct political thought has served one far better in China than rigorous scientific thought. But now Peking seems to accept as possible that a technologically inferior nation can lead a march into a new world. The Chinese have set their sights on the year 2000. It is their goal that by that year, China will, by any standard, be marching at the head of the parade of nations. The Ambassador International Cultural Foundation, in accordance with its purpose of promoting understanding among nations, has agreed to aid the Chinese in their pursuit of modernization. Yes, well, Last August, feel, on a separate visit to the People's say. Republic, AICF Executive Vice President Stanley Rayner solidified an agreement with Chinese educational officials whereby the AICF will sponsor numerous educational projects. At ceremonies held in the Peking Hotel, Mr. Rayner presented the Chinese with the Foundation's first contribution. The AICF will also be aiding Chinese librarians at the National Library, Peking Teachers University, and University of Peking in expanding their collection. Symbolizing this support, Mr. Rader presented the library with a number of complete sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. This comes from the foundation with greetings from Pasadena from Mr. Herbert Armstrong, who, although not here today, is here with us spiritually and morally and will be here with us on November 3rd. It gives me great pleasure to present you with volume A, as well as the rest of the books, which I'm sure will get tremendous use here at the university. <clears throat> we are... The Chinese were most appreciative and took special care to ensure that Mr. Rader and Mr. Armstrong, upon his arrival, saw their country firsthand. The People's Square is the heart of Peking. Over one million people could assemble here and have done so in the past. 
Government buildings, including the Great Hall of the People, seat of the Republic's government, stand to either side of the square. A number of monuments commemorating the Communist Revolution, extolling the revolution as a victory of the Chinese against imperialism and oppression, also stand in the square. And nearby, the shrine containing the body of the great helmsman, Chairman Mao Zedong, the man who, more than any other, put his personal stamp on the revolution and on the new China to which it gave birth. Just off People's Square stands one wall of the Forbidden City. Inside are the palaces and grounds of the emperors who ruled a China long since gone. At a banquet in his honor on the evening of the second day of his visit in Peking, Herbert W. Armstrong spoke to 400 guests at the world-famous Peking Duck Restaurant. The audience included high-ranking government officials and Chinese educators. Although addressing a predominantly communist audience, Mr. Armstrong announced God's soon-coming intervention in world affairs. All of the troubles in this world have come from living the wrong way, having the wrong attitude toward ourselves, toward others, toward one another, and we're going to come to the time of world peace. We're going to have a utopia on earth. People will laugh when I say the word utopia. Why should it be impossible? Why should we not have it? All we have to do is live the way we ought to, and all of us are going to be doing that, and in our time in this generation, well, I am not here to convince anybody of anything. I am merely here to make an announcement and to tell you that that is coming, and peace and happiness and joy is coming. We're going to learn the way to live. We're going to begin to live that way, and it is coming in our time. That is the world's only hope, and that's what I am proclaiming around the world. China, inside the wall, will return in a moment. Kingdoms and nations throughout the ages have proclaimed peace, yet waged war. In the last century alone, there have been two world wars to end all wars. Will man ever find peace? Herbert W. Armstrong travels around the world, meeting with heads of state, explaining that man's only hope of survival is the establishment of one world government. Foretelling a time of happiness and prosperity for all mankind, he reveals not only the causes, but the solutions for human troubles. This message of soon coming world peace is explained in depth in the free booklet, Just What Do You Mean, Kingdom of God. Request your free copy of Just What Do You Mean, Kingdom of God. All right, friends, we have to cut out right there because we've been asked not to let it show the 800 number or the address that a new administration now controls and they don't they don't want requests for this booklet because they're not sending it out and of course we really don't want people calling the new administration that uh, doesn't want to send that out anymore okay the phone number has gone off the screen we can cut back now and pick up with mr armstrong <laughs> The following evening, the site was Peking's Great Hall of the People, the official nerve center of the Chinese government from which all Communist Party activities are controlled. Mr. Armstrong was introduced by Mr. Yamashita, a senior member of the Japanese Diet. Mr. Armstrong powerfully addressed not only Chinese officials, but also ambassadors representing 76 nations. Again, his topic was the good news of the coming kingdom of God. Modern science uh, claimed here some quite a while ago 
that we could throw away the crutch of superstition and religion now, that science was going to be the new messiah that would save the world. But the principal things that science have contributed, the one perhaps is nuclear power and the weapons of mass destruction that now can erase all human life from off this earth. It is said now that there, the weapons are in existence, and at least two nations possess them, and, and many others. I think this nation here possesses uh, uh, that uh, type of uh, weaponry that uh, could erase human life 50 times over, and once would certainly be quite enough. But many leading scientists in the world have been pointing out that there is only one solution. The greatest world problem right now is the question of survival, human survival. Will human life be living by the beginning of the 21st century? And they say that if we don't explode human life and blast it off the earth by the, uh, the, by the weapons of mass destruction, that uh, uh, the population explosion will do it. Many leading scientists say the only hope is a single one world nation ruling all of the nations of the earth. Only one military establishment and no other uh, military power that could attack it. And yet they say that that's utterly impossible and in the hands of man it is. But some time ago the editor of a weekly news magazine in the United States in an editorial was saying that it would seem now that the only hope of human survival in this world is the sudden intervention of a powerful unseen hand from someplace. And I'm here to announce that that is going to happen. That's precisely what is going to happen. And in our time, and peace is coming to all nations and to the whole world. The Chinese recognized Herbert Armstrong as a prominent religious leader, humanitarian, and educator. They were particularly anxious that Mr. Armstrong, as an educator, would appreciate the tremendous changes now taking place in Chinese education at all levels. Changes designed to recapture at least some of what Mr. Armstrong has long termed the true values in education, including discipline, scholarship, and excellence without which not any nation or people, however great, can achieve lasting success. I want to say that there are two general ways of life. Whether it is the individual in the home, whether it is in our everyday occupations, wherever we are, or whether it is between governments. I like to simplify it and say it so simply and plainly that a little child could understand. One is the way of give. The other way is the way of get. And I think about every philosophy that you can think of as a way of life will uh, boil down to one of those two ways. Now the way of get is the way the world is going. That is the world of I love me, I don't care about anybody else. I only love myself. It is the way of vanity the way of lust and greed. It is the way of jealousy and envy toward other people. The way of competition that leads to strife and to violence and to war. It is the way of rebellion against authority over one. The other way of life is the way of give, or perhaps better expressed in the terms of the word love. But love is an outgoing concern, not incoming. It is outgoing toward others. It is the way of wanting to help others, wanting to serve, being kind and gentle to others, having respect toward others. It is perhaps true that the most significant changes taking place in China today involve the transformation of Chinese education. That's your book. That's your book. That's your book. Mao Zedong believed that the key to understanding history and the world was to understand that everything consisted of 
contradictions. While perhaps not true of either history or the world, contradiction certainly provides the key to understanding Mao. And in no sphere was this more clearly and devastatingly evident than in education. Mao acutely felt China's backwardness, the legacy of centuries of stagnation. Yet he never came to trust China's intellectuals or her educators, and eventually he suppressed them. The most devastating blow was the Cultural Revolution of the mid-1960s. The Cultural Revolution brought an end to scientific research in China, made education a brand of shame, and resulted in virtually all institutions of higher learning being closed for nearly five years. China's present leaders openly acknowledge that the excesses of the 1960s set their nation back technologically a full decade. Today, they are striving to recover from those years of turmoil through a renewed emphasis on learning and excellence. Publicly, although somewhat simplistically, the setback is blamed on a group of formerly powerful officials now known as the Gang of Four. Not since before the communist victory in 1949 has the study of English been so widely pursued in China. Evidence of the Chinese anxiousness to cultivate relationships with the scholars and the scholarship of the Western world. During his visits to China, Stanley Rader was recognized by his hosts as a prominent American lawyer and legal scholar and invited to lecture at the University of Peking's School of Law. The American experience, as you know, is rather recent by comparison to China's long history. And our culture draws very heavily from what we call Western civilization as it was known in Europe, namely the English and the Roman law. Uh, it's also important to note that the most significant influence on the American colonies of New England in the 17th century was the Christian religion. The Puritan ethics or the Quaker theology dictated much of what the law should be in the colonies. And it's no surprise to see that clergymen were often entrusted with the responsibility to govern and to control the local settlements. China inside the wall will return in a moment. The recent trip to China by Herbert W. Armstrong was a landmark event. This, the first official visit to China by a religious leader in nearly half a century, was one of many visits by Mr. Armstrong to heads of state around the world. As an ambassador without portfolio, Mr. Armstrong not only points the way to world peace, but also through the Ambassador International Cultural Foundation, presently supports humanitarian projects in nations worldwide. These visits by Herbert W. Armstrong and their significance are covered in depth by The Plain Truth magazine. All right, friends, we got to cut out there, and The Plain Truth magazine is no longer being published, but the, a lot of the old editions, uh, in fact, just about all of the old editions, are online. And can be easily, and there are indexes to them. So, and there are good articles in there certainly to read. But uh, I've got to roll off the 800 phone number and the address um, because uh, not only is it no longer being published, but also uh, w the phone number that comes up where people might call and ask for it if they could see this phone number uh, is now answered by a new administration that just did a total flip-flop on uh, what Mr. Armstrong 
the truths that Mr. Armstrong taught. Okay, we've got it queued back up to where Mr. Armstrong in China will be coming back up. So let's go back now to Mr. Mr. Armstrong. It is an arduous task, Mao Zedong said, to ensure a better life for the several hundred million people of China. To succeed, he added, we must constantly rid ourselves of whatever is wrong. The instability, the disappointments, the setback in China largely stemmed from the zealotry of those who found in Mao's words a justification for never-ending revolution and unceasing purification of political thought. In Mao's final years, two opinions contested for the mantle of rulership, both claiming foundation in the chairman's doctrines. One opinion, championed by the Gang of Four, favor the tumultuous legacy of the Cultural Revolution. The other opinion held that China's most pressing need was not constant correction of political attitudes, but progress. There has been no new revolution here, no coup per se, no official change in government. And yet, without question, one of the world's most significant geopolitical developments in recent years has been the triumph of moderate, pro-progress leadership in China. The memory of Chairman Mao is still revered, but of the great helmsman's legacy, the present leadership is now ridding itself of much it finds wrong. Among the highlights of Herbert Armstrong's visit was a conversation with one leader of what might rightly be termed the new China. Vice Chairman the two men shared perspectives gained by their long experiences observing world conditions from opposite sides of the globe. Vice Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, Tan Zen Lin, heard the message that ultimate solutions to the problems of nations would not emerge through the efforts of human leadership. Symbolizing the friendship and cordiality of the meeting and of his entire visit, Mr. Armstrong presented a gift of Steuben Crystal to the Vice Chairman. China has always been a hard land. The communist revolutionaries won control by bringing vision to a people who had never known vision before. It is a diverse land. For centuries, there has been doubt that China's many ethnic groups and languages could comprise a single nation. China is a land of ideology. Although certain religious groups, including Christian ones, are allowed to exist here, the supreme gods are political deities. None of this sets China apart. Other nations were forged out of vision. Other nations have blended diverse peoples into one. And all nations have their political demigods, although they may not so strenuously pay them homage. <laughs> what sets China apart is that the Chinese seem too much of one mind, too much in step, too capable of blending into the world's largest crowd. But those are reflections from the surface of a sea of faces. The great helmsman envisioned an era of perpetual peace for mankind. The problem in China, as in all nations, remains the elusiveness of that vision. Not one religion of the established religions on earth knows who or what God is. Now that is a very shocking statement but it is true. Not a single religion knows what and why man is. How did man come to be on this earth? What is man? How did he come to be here? What is the purpose? Is there any purpose in life? Are we here for a purpose? Of all of the religions on earth, not one knows really what happens in the hereafter. There are so many ideas there are many superstitions, 
but not one has the real knowledge of what really is lies ahead in the hereafter. Of all of the religions in the world, not one knows what is the true, ultimate human potential. Peace is coming to all nations and to the whole world because we're going to have to find another way of life. We are going to find it. We're going to be forced to find it. And it's a, be a way that will bring peace and happiness and prosperity to all and eternal salvation. Thank you very much. Friends, we'll go ahead and cut out right there, and let me uh, come back here, come out and come back here with you. Whoops! Oh, I'm supposed to I'm supposed to stop that before that got on the screen. Let me see. All right, we'll just go ahead and pop something else up there in the background. All right, there's a scripture or two I'm going to want to show. Looks like though, somehow, bear with me a moment, uh, because friends, when I talk to you and I show you these scriptures. A little zoom out full. I'll take care of that in a minute while it's zoomed out. I'll see if I can fix this screen maybe. Um, all right, where we want to go now. You know, Mr. Armstrong was talking about the at the end there in such a wonderful way, the wonderful world tomorrow that will be coming. Well, for us to get from where we are right now to that point, which really that point will represent uh, what this, slide is showing where this rock comes from out of the sky and crashes this da this big statue that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and that God revealed the me the dream and the meaning of the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar by and through Daniel and that that uh, now you see the rock there that's that's that represents Christ coming and crushing that statue that represents all the governments of the earth now, basically, the governments at the, from the legs down are part of the Roman government. So you say, well, wait a minute, that does, how can that include uh, the United States government? Well, it'll include the United States government because before the government that's represented by those two feet, the ten toes and that two feet, uh, as soon as it comes into power, one of the first things it's going to do as God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong has explained to us from prophecy is that beast, the, 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 the one emperor, dictator that those ten concurrent leaders elect put in place with the Pope crowning him in most likely the Emperor's Hall, the Kaiser's Hall in Frankfurt, Germany, where they've crowned the past kings of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, that that seventh king, that beast, one of the first things he's going to do is fulfill the prophecy God gave us through Ezekiel in chapter 6, verse 6, where it says to the modern-day sons of Joseph, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States, if you don't repent, you know, we could repent and stop it, but we won't. I mean, we've, we've proved that. And it says to the modern-day sons of Joseph. Again, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States. All of your cities will be laid waste. That's one of the first things the beast is going to do, is knock out the allies from World War II that defeated, that helped defeat uh, Germany in World War II. Now, why am I jumping to Germany? Because Germany is most likely going to produce, Germany or Austria, one or the other, uh, you know, the modern-day Assyrians, is going to produce the the emperor, the king, the, the emperor that becomes the seventh king. And so that kingdom of God that's ushered in when that, that stone comes up, let's see, uh, how do I get this thing? Uh, oh, yeah, if I go to this screen over here and change it to this screen, I think, it would it be this one? Nah, not that one. Let's get that lower third out of the way and see if I can actually get to this. Uh, it'll be, bear with me a moment. I'm using different software tonight that I've been using all week. And all the buttons are 
different. I think it's this one right here. Okay. Now, actually, I'm going to want to show you the details of this later, but I want to be able to zoom out to this uh, photograph in the bottom over here uh, again, where when Christ returns, he's going to destroy all the governments of this world and replace it with the kingdom of God. So we, we won't have then a government of China. Now, we'll have China and the Chinese people, but they won't have the present government because the kingdom of God is going to rule over China as well as the other nations around the world because all their governments will be knocked out by Christ um, all right now here's what I was going to do so let me stay with the program that I told you I, I would I would be doing in some detail let's come out here for a second okay on this wall far wall the far screen we've got the drawing of the Revelation 13 beast that comes from the ocean. That also happens to be the same beast described by Daniel in chapter 7 of Daniel. And we'll quickly, quickly go through that tonight in a few moments. And I'm trying not to keep you long because it's turned cold. And I know many of you would like to perhaps get to bed early on this cold Friday night with the days getting shorter. And so would I. <laughs> I think it would do us all good to get a good night of sleep, be refreshed for the Sabbath, and then we'll be back here with Sabbath at TV during the daytime for a, uh, an AM service to the United States, a PM service for the United Kingdom tomorrow that I do in the morning. And then when I do it in the morning, it's afternoon already in the UK. So we say AM to the US, PM to the United Kingdom. One service covering covering both. We started at 9.30 a.m. Central Time. That's 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I know that's early for you on the West Coast. And that would be 7.30 a.m. on the West Coast. But we put it in the archive within an hour after we're, we've st streamed live. It's even available faster than that on Facebook Live now. Their rendering is pretty quick. And so you can just watch it from the archive or from, from a recording that remains on Facebook Live any time throughout the day on the Sabbath. But let's go through these two beasts from Revelation 13. The one from the ocean over here and then over on this other side of the room, the one from the land, both of which are mentioned in Revelation 13. But we'll start with this beast from the ocean that's mentioned at the beginning of Revelation 13 and also mentioned in Daniel 7. So let's do this. Friends, let me go ahead and bring up, and we'll go over here and go to this beast from uh, on this side of the room from uh, the ocean, from Daniel 7 and the first part of Revelation 13. And let's just go through it. And you, you'll see how, we're, and we start with this beast because this beast goes all the way back to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he goes back to King Nebuchadnezzar via, you see the lion's head? toward the left side of this beast that looks has a leopard's body. Um, on the left side, there's a lion's head. That lion's head is what represents King Nebuchadnezzar. And it's the same, if you put it, Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 side by side, the lion's head and the head of gold on the big statue are one and the same. They're both King Nebuchadnezzar. Let me see... If I have, they both represent things. Yeah, I do. I have this chart right here that's got this part side by side. Uh, and and the, on the right side is more of what is described in Daniel 7 with four beasts, with the first one having the head of a lion and the, and the wings. But it's, you see we've got it parallel hill here with the head of gold from the statue and that being the Chaldean Empire, going back to King Nebuchadnezzar. And let me read you real quickly Daniel 7. And keep this slide up on the screen so you can, looking at the right side of this, you can see exactly what it is Daniel is talking about here in chapter 7 of Daniel. Opening up with, well, let's pick up in about verse 4, uh, or verse 3, where it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea. And so that's why 
that's why Daniel 7 relates to the early part of Revelation 13 with this beast pictured, you know, coming up from out of the sea. And you'll see in these two different things here how they, how much, how it's really the same thing. And four beasts, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, like you can see up there in the top. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And so this is all picturing King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel 2 ex explains that more clearly because it actually states that you, O great king, are this head of gold. And then the second beast, uh, which represents another world ruling empire that Daniel 2 described as arms and breast of silver. But here in Daniel 7, God's going to describe it through Daniel in verse 5 as a bear. And, this, and behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And it was a uh, warlike, uh, dominion-creating, world-ruling empire that did, in fact, devour much, much flesh, the Persians. After this I beheld, verse 6, And lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads and dominion was given unto it. This was the meco Greconian Empire. It began with Alexander and then was given over to his four generals. And that's why the four heads are pictured on, on this third beast. And then after this, verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now, that fourth beast relates to those two legs of iron. If we back up to that third beast with the four leopards' head, that relates to the statue, part of the statue of bronze, the belly and thighs of bronze. And all of that's the third world ruling empire that God would, gave the details of in Daniel 2, where he said, after you shall arise another, you know, in another world ruling empire. And then finally, that last world ruling empire that got the Roman Empire that was divided into the East and Western Division. And this beast from Daniel 7, it relates to, with those ten horns, it relates historically to something that we're able to trace. And especially so, let's go on and go back to that, that uh, beast from the ocean, Revelation 13. You see, it's the same. You see, uh, let me read that. Let's read that while I keep this up here. You'll see it follows the same four beasts that are mentioned by Daniel in chapter 7 in the first part of Revelation 13. And let me give you a moment if you want to turn there with me while I turn there as well. First part of Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. See, same thing described about the fourth beast in Daniel 7. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So you see here it's pictured with a leopard's body and a leopard's tail and, and arms. But then it, we're, we're going to change the paws and the feet, though, because it says, And his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, that's like the gold on the statue, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So we're talking about 
governments with great authority, world-ruling governments. And verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which is the symbol in the Bible for the devil, as explained in Revelation 12, verse 9. If you need to look at that, that'll tell you. That old dragon, that serpent, uh, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. But going on here in verse 4 of Revelation 13, which the dragon, the devil, gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He's so powerful and great, a big super government. And verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was... And the, now, that's referring to the, the woman that rides the beast, actually. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, which is the same as 1260 days or three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, God's name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over all the kindreds and tongues and all nations. So this is a world-ruling government with dominion over the entire world. But this particular beast from the ocean, it reaches all the way back, as we were saying, to King Nebuchadnezzar, represented by that head of lion on the left side of the body of this beast. And then over to the bear, after King Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldean Empire, the Persian Empire, represented by that bear toward the, toward the left paw of the beast on your right side of the picture. And then in between the head of the lion and the bear, down below them there, there are the four heads from the third world ruling empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire. Alexander, his four generals, pictured by those four heads, that they took over after Alexander. And then that so that's six heads, the lion, the bear, the four heads of the leopard. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh head on the very top there, the dreadful, terrible, iron-like head with the iron-like teeth and ten horns on it. That's on the very top, and you see the horns, and I got, I got smoke coming out of the horns, and I tie that smoke to the other beast, which I'll do for you in a moment when we pull up another slide, and I relate for you to show you how this beast from the ocean and the beast over here on the other side of the room from the land, how they, how they relate. But this beast from the ocean goes back further in time than does the beast from the land. This beast from the ocean goes all the way back to that lion's head, to the time of King Nebuchadnezzar in the Chaldean Empire. That takes us back, roughly, that takes us back to about 1100 uh, B.C., and if you take it the other way from the time of Adam, just to have a reference from where, from where this uh, beast from the ocean begins, to, to have a reference point on that from, from Adam. You know, Adam lived just short of a thousand years. I forget the exact number. What was it, 970? Um, or if we look at, I think, where's it talk about Adam dying? Was that in Genesis 6? But he, he didn't quite make a thousand. You know, God told him prophetically, in the day that you eat of that forbidden fruit, you shall die. Well, in prophecy, a year is as a thousand, uh, a day is as a thousand years. So God was saying to him, in the day you eat, in the thousand years you eat, you shall die. You know, and so prophetically, that day he would have a, he would, he would die within a thousand years, and he did. Um, and God saw the wickedness of man. Oh, we're already getting into the uh, God thinking of the flood by the time we get to uh, Genesis 6, and then the flood is, is described in Genesis 7. And, uh, where does, and this is the book of the generations of Adam. And Adam lived 130 years, begat a son, all right, and all the days that Adam lived were, verse 5 of Genesis 5, real easy if you wanted to remember how long did Adam live, it's verse 5, chapter 5, Genesis, Genesis 5, 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. All right, he didn't make 970, he only made 930. I knew there were 70 involved, though, because if you subtract 
uh, 70 from 1,000, you get 930 years. So God cut Adam short of 1,000 years by 70 years. Adam lived to be a 930 years old. All right, so, but almost a thousand. If you want to just think of it in round numbers, you know, all right, by the time Adam was dead, a thousand years gone by, just just in round numbers. Then within 500 years later, by the time we get over to verse 5 of, of, uh, of Genesis, I didn't mean to say verse 5, I meant to say chapter 5, really, I meant to say uh, chapter 6. By the time we get to chapter 6, God is saying that the, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were taking wives of whomever they pleased and God said my uh, spirit shall not always strive with man for that he's also flesh yet his days shall be 120 years God was already saying 120 years from now will be the flood uh, in Genesis 6 and at one somewhere in here God will even say that uh, and the Lord God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. Uh, that verse right there says what I was about to say uh, to you, that God became so upset with man that it repented God that he even made man. But thankfully, there have been some after this, Noah and and King David really was a man after God's heart that pleased God very much, even though David, you know, did some woeful sins for which many of us should be thankful. And I, I, that may sound strange to say, but brethren, when you've sinned and you say, man, I keep doing this sin, and you're trying to overcome, if there have been periods for you in your life like there have, have been mine where, I try to overcome it, and I find myself just steeped in it. I'm not any more, thankfully. Some of those things, whew, finally God's helped me overcome some of those uh, with a lot of great mercy on his part. Just, all right, Steve, I'm, I'm going to help you. You, you. you got the point. You, uh, <laughs> you're full of sin. <laughs> and if I don't help you, hey, <laughs> you'll never get rid of this. But, you know, if, but we need to ask him. He won't just do that unless we're asking him. Okay, God, look, I see this. and I'm, pff, you got to help me. And he will. But uh, uh, David is a great encouragement if you're in the point of, if you're in a point, and, but we, and frankly, we really are until we're converted out of this flesh, until we're transformed from flesh to spirit, we're subject to sin. I mean, we're, we're subject to temptation. We have to press against it to not do it. And, you know, not to even spin it around in our head. And, it, and Christ, when he fulfilled the law and made it fuller, he said, you don't have to actually do the sin. You just got to spin it around in your head. You just got to look, for example, on adultery. You don't have to actually hop in the sack with somebody else's mate or somebody you're not married to. You just spinning around in your head like I'd like to do that you know well that might thought might come but you better throw it out if you st sit there and spin it around boy wouldn't it be nice to yeah well you know thankfully Moses set a good example there and said saying uh, uh, the uh, something about the pleasures of sin for a season some of you know that verse that he wouldn't he wouldn't go there and that's where we have to be. We have to not even go there, not even spin it around. It comes, the thought comes in, Satan's going to put them in there for us. You know, we have to not only overcome ourselves, we have to overcome Satan whamming away at us. As soon as he pops one of those thoughts in, we're on that frequency, you know, where we, we hear that radio station he broadcast on. But we, we have to keep putting things in there that block that out and that, help, you know, and helps us throw it out. But God became so upset with man that he did the flood. Now, that happened at 1,656 years. So, And since he announced it for 120 years, uh, let's just round that off at 1,500. So, so from the time of Adam being created, Adam and Eve, and then Adam dies just short of 1,000 years, and then with, uh, about 500 years later, God's upset with man so much he tells Noah, we're going to do the flood, you know, announce it to man, you got 120 years. And... 
then 1656 after creation of man is the flood and if we just kind of round that so you can spin numbers round if I put them on a chart it would have been easier but zero Adam was created 1500 was the flood you know by a thousand Adam died 1500 God was announcing the flood again it actually happened on 1656 so you know there's the actual number but I'm throwing round numbers at you so he started announcing the flood about 1500 and then uh, since Christ came at about 4000 using round numbers from the time of the creation of, of uh, Adam. So we got creation at zero, starts announcing the flood around 1500, you know, a little after that, of course. And then uh, Christ comes at 4000. In between there, in between 1500 and 4000, 1100 years before Christ came, we've got uh, King Nebuchadnezzar on the scene. So that would have put it at about using round numbers now that would have put it at about 3,000 so zero Adam is created 1,000 Adam he's died 70 years before 1,000 1,500 roughly 1,600 you got the flood now got announcing the flood then 3,000 you've got King Nebuchadnezzar on the scene technically that would be like 2,900 if Christ came on 4,000 exactly it'd, it'd be 11 years before that would be 2,900 I'm just rounding it off at 3,000 so you can get a picture of uh, where we are when this when this beast from the ocean the, the timing it represents with the first head the, the head of uh, of the lion on that thing let me pop it back full screen for a moment the head of the lion there represents a period in time of of about 2,900 years after man was created, almost 3,000 years after man was created, is when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was on the scene. Then after that, you had the the uh, Persian Empire, Cyrus. Uh, let's see, he was on the scene. Um, it would have been about 500 years later, so about 500 years before Christ. We got that bear. And then Alexander the Great, about 150 years after the Persian Empire, so uh, is forming Romulus. Uh, let's see, and then and then, and then that head up there, the uh, about 70 years before Christ, that thing comes into uh, into vogue, uh, and it represents Rome. Now, Rom Romulus, 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 who actually you know created Rome. That happened about 700 years before Christ, but it didn't become a world ruling power until it had defeated uh, the Greco Macedonian Empire. So uh, that was around 70 years before Christ. So there, I'm just giving you some idea how this beast from the ocean, all the elements of it, begin before Christ comes. It, they begin before it, but not all the horns. Now you see that 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 head, the fourth of the fourth beast, that dreadful and terrible head with the iron teeth and the ten horns. Uh, none of those horns come into effect. Well, wait a second. I'm not sure about when the three get, what the dating of those three that get plucked up are. But the last seven horns are after. Christ has come and gone. The, the head begins before Christ. Uh, Christ comes. Christ dies for the sins of man. And then the last seven horns are well after Christ has come. The, the first one of those last seven with Justinian begins at 554 A.D. after Christ. B.C.E. as the modern world wants to call it and eliminate any reference to Christ or his death. Uh, but you know, I'm going to still stick with 554 A.D. You know, after, after and um, you know, after Christ has come. All right, now let me come back to you for a moment because um, let's let's spend just a moment going through who those seven last horns represent, and then we'll tie them tie them over here to the beast from the land on the far on your far right side on that last screen on the far right side. Um, all right, let's just tell you this, and I, and I think this—I think you can get this. Uh, what I'm going to do is change my screen so that we can put the chart that's got the uh, 
I want to put them on this side, on this screen, where I can zoom in and out on them for you. Let's go type on this chart. And up to the upper upper left-hand corner of this, we've got... Um, do I have buttons for all this? What happened to my buttons? Um, hold on a second. Let me see if I've got those here. Eh. Okay. I've changed this software around so many times when we're trying out new software. I had the buttons that would zoom in and out on these guys. Yeah. Oh, it's on the new software. Terrific, Stephen. Terrific. Okay. Well, I can at least just point them out to you here. And in the upper left-hand corner, and, but let me come in a little tighter as we do this so you can see them a little better. I think this one will, yeah, that'll tighten it up a little bit. Um, the upper left-hand corner, uh, a, a, a graphic, a drawing of Justinian, who restored the old imperial uh, empire before, before it had its deadly wound. He restored it in 554 A.D., and then it had a 1260-year a continuous reign through the first five kings. And this ties in and references or relates to Revelation 17, verse 10. That's kind of important to keep in mind where God, through speaking through the writing of um, the Apostle John in 90 A.D., tells us that... Um, Hang on a minute, I'm trying to line up my shot so I can come back on here with you just for a second um, as I explain this. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 10 has several elements to it. It starts out by saying there are seven kings. And brethren, you may be saying, well, Stephen, why is it important for all of us to know all this? I mean, that old King Justinian, he goes way back to 554 A.D. That's more than a thousand years ago. Well, yeah, it is important because listen to verse, listen to Revelation 17, verse 10. Listen to the whole verse. Just get the, get the idea in mind, the outline in mind, if you will, please. It starts out saying there are seven kings. Then John says, now, and, and of course when John wrote that back in 90 A.D., none of those seven kings had even been born yet. And yet he's going to go on next and say five are fallen. Well, again, at the point where he's saying five are fallen, none of the seven or none of the five that are fallen have even been born yet. And then he goes on, third element of that verse goes on and says, and one is. So there's seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. Now, when John is writing this back in 90 A.D., the seven haven't been born, the five haven't fallen, and the one that is isn't even born yet. But he's projecting it ahead in prophecy and to a very specific point in time. And this is very important to understand this, brethren, because it establishes something that we should not forget or throw away, as some are starting to do. I see some that are there with it. And then if you don't stay with it, if you don't keep it refreshed in your mind from Sabbath to Sabbath, week to week, that's why God has the Sabbath. He wants us to be refreshed with his truth and keep it. He says, hold fast. And so during the week, you listen to these nuts that preach at you that uh, get away from the truths God taught us through Mr. Armstrong. We shouldn't do that. And this one that says one is tells us whom we should be listening to. And that ties in with Revelation 3, verse 3, where, where with God saying, hold fast. And remember by and through whom you learn things. Revelation 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard and hold fast. And if you have forgotten some of that, repent of it, he says. Well, how did we get these truths? We got them through the one man God was working through, through whom he revealed who is the one is of Revelation 17.10. Now, the five that are fallen, I'm going to go through them in a moment, are Justinian through Napoleon. And then the one is, was, Napoleon, who was, is, between 1935 and 1945. Now, why is that significant? Because that's 
the heyday, as if it were, you might put it this way. That, that's the heyday of God's end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong, who was born in 1892. So when Mussolini came into power in 1935, the, the fall of 1935, that would have been after Mr. Armstrong's birthday in July, just for age reasons. 1892 to 1935 would have made Mr. Armstrong 35 plus 8, 43 years old at the time Mussolini came in power. And when he went out of power 10 years later in the spring, nine and a half years later, it would have been before Mr. Armstrong's birthday Mr. Armstrong, uh, in, in 1945, so Mr. Armstrong would have been 43 plus 9, 52 years old. So during the prime part of God's end time apostle's life, the one is mentioned in Revelation 17, the being mentioned, the king, the sixth king mentioned in Revelation 17 verse 10 as the one that is, was is during Mr. Armstrong's lifetime between his age of 43 years old and 52 years old. When he was broadcasting coast to coast in the United States and then since the first 19 year time cycle began in 1927 or the work began in 1933 so he actually puts the second 19 year time cycle in where is it some of you that remember this around 19 was it 51 or was it 53 um, but all of that time at that time from his age uh, 43 to the age he was 52, uh, and then the year would have been 45. Okay, so it would have been before the second 19-year period. In the very first 19-year time cycle of the work God was doing through Mr. Armstrong, God revealed Mr. Armstrong as his servant. The way he mentions in Revelation who he reveals a servant to is by giving information through those servants. If you look right at the beginning, Revelation 1, it's where it starts out saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And God gave uh, the understanding of the six seals to his servant, Mr. Herbert Armstrong. Nobody before him was able to reveal the fact that the Gospels, are the plan, have the plain the gospel the sections of the gospel Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 have in plain language Jesus Christ speaking giving in plain language the meaning of the seven seals of the book of Revelation that fact that revelation that the plain language explanation of those seals is in Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 was given to us as a revelation of Jesus Christ through his servant Herbert Armstrong and Revelation 3 3 tells us to hold fast to those kind of truths and remember by and through whom you heard them let me read it exactly like it says it again it says uh, remember therefore how you received and heard and hold fast to that those truths that you received and heard through God's servant Herbert Armstrong. And Mussolini is another factor. Not only the seven seals and their plain language meaning from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but the fact that the, the one that is was is during Mr. Armstrong's prime years, and it was through Mr. Armstrong's voice that God revealed to us that the one that is, that sixth king, was Miss Mussolini. I can't say is Mussolini. The one is, because now that we've passed since we passed 1945, April 28, 1945, in fact, when he was shot in the belly, as you can see in that picture on the third road down on the far right side of this, Mussolini was shot in the belly and then hung upside down along with his mistress and comrades from the canopy of an SO gasoline station in Italy. That ended the sixth kingship. And so the next part of Revelation 17, verse 10, we were going through it. Revelation 17, 10 says there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is. And then it says, and one is yet to come. Now that's where we are in that prophecy, that fourth element. Because uh, we know there's a total of seven, that one that's yet to come, he's going to be the last. Because when you add them up, 
five are fallen. The one is has come and gone. He's fallen two now. So you put the second and third elements together. There's seven kings. Five are fallen, and the one is has fallen. So that's six that are fallen by tying the second and third together at this point in time with the understanding God has given us through his end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong about who that sixth one was and when he was. He was the is from 1935 to 1945. He's now the was, a has-been, and one is yet to come. That's where we are in that prophecy, verse 10 of Revelation 17, and one is yet to come, and he'll last for a short time. How does it say it exactly? Let me not paraphrase that too much or I'll, 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 I'll miss the mark. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space, as the King James Version renders it. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which uh, you saw are ten kings. All right, we'll, we'll elaborate on those elements in a moment. Uh, all right, but on this chart, here they are. You, the five that are fallen, we know who they are. Uh, they reign for a 1260-year continuous reign from when Justinian began in uh, 554, followed by Charlemagne. You see the uh, in the middle on the top row uh, a portrait of uh, the Pope crowning Charlemagne. On the far right, there's Otto the Great. Uh, right here next to me on the second row, the fourth king is Charles V. And right in the middle of this second row, with that infamous hat of Napoleon, there's the fifth king. Napoleon, who in the year before the Battle of Waterloo, in the Battle of 1814, he lost uh, he, he lost the empire. He, and, and he ended in 1814 the 1260-year continuous reign. Now some of you may be saying, well, wait a minute, Stephen. The Battle of Waterloo was 1815. Well, yeah, so what? He lost the kingdom in 1814 in a big battle. The battle he did in 1815, he, scra he scavengered up an army, and he got himself a good army. But this is after he lost the empire in 1814. He scavengered up an army a year later in 1815 and did battle in Waterloo. And our brother, our brother, uh, our twin brother Ephraim in the United Kingdom, God gave Ephraim the ability to size up Napoleon's battle plan, and they figured it out, and they encircled it with a couple of battle fronts, and they, and it was what should have been a great victory for Napoleon. Brother Ephraim outsmarted him through God's helping Ephraim, because he didn't want he didn't want to come back for Napoleon. He wanted he wanted that to be be it. But see how the God of this world works. He you lose. I ain't, I'm not down. I'm going to try. I'm going to go back and try to get it, get it back. Well, he lost. He didn't get it back. So his, his, his defeat times out with the Battle of 1814. So he made a comeback fight in 1815. He lost that comeback fight. So he, he wasn't able to regain it, restore it, regrab it, none of that. So the Battle of 1814, a year before the Battle of Waterloo, a terrible defeat at Waterloo too, uh, so terrible that that's why people today make that reference to oh that's your Waterloo if you blow something real bad um, but he already blew it in 1814 so from 554 with Justinian restoring the imperial Roman Empire to 1814 when Napoleon lost the battle of 1814 add the numbers that's 1260 years continuous reign that's a prophetic number has a reference and there ties in with the 1260 days we're going to go through before Christ returns from the time of the beginning of the fifth seal which a whole bunch of things happen at that but that's another subject let me I may try to cover that for you just before we close up but let me do what I said I'd do let's tie in with that beast from the land I just want and and uh, these seven kings they relate to the seven horns on the beast from the ocean and they relate to the seven heads on the beast from the land. So these are a tie-in between both beasts. And in fact, they're basically the only tie-in because only the beast from the, the ocean, 
the beast from the sea, only that beast goes back to King Nebuchadnezzar. The beast from the land, it picks up with this Justinian fellow and the and the three little horns before him, the Astrogaz and whoever those three little horns that they got plucked up were. Um, they're on that beast from the land, but not but not the early empires, not the head, the lion representing the gold, the Chaldean Empire with Nebuchadnezzar, not the bear, the bear's head, and the same as from Daniel 7, same as the silver from Daniel 2, representing the Persian Empire, and the four heads on the, the beast from the ocean. Should I go back? Should I put that on the screen while I say it? Let's go ahead and pop out here and do that, because we, we've covered these guys. We'll, I'll pull this back up and cover that crown representing the seventh head at the very end because after we cover the yeah that'll be a good point to cover what we're looking to come but to show you how these two beasts relate uh, and that's what we're looking for out of the whole thing I see oh <sighs> let me get my buttons straight here all right this is what I want to do I want to go back to that and come out here so we can see both screens all right over on this side the beast of the ocean just one quick look at this again. Goes all the way back to King Nebuchadnezzar with the lion's head, the bear's head, the four leopard's head. Goes back to King Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean Empire, the bear, the Persian Empire, the four heads of the leopards, uh, the the uh, the Greek Empire, Macedonian Greek Empire, Greco-Macedonian, and then that head up there, the Roman Empire. That's going to tie in and relate to this beast from the land here on the other side. Now, you see the smoke that goes up, uh, the little arrows that comes up from the smoke? I think I can show you that better if we come back here. I've got a graphic up next to me here. I've got the two side by side. I'm going to put on the screen for a moment while we, uh, while we show you how these tie together. All right. On the beast from the ocean down at the bottom, you see the seven horns coming off, and I got the smoke coming out of the horns. You see, like right here, the smoke that comes up on this one ties into one of the heads. So you got seven last horns, and you got seven heads on this beast from the land. So these seven horns, which represent Justinian through Napoleon, that we just went through on the pictures, um, those seven horns and those seven heads are the same thing. These seven heads on this beast from the land are the seven last horns of the, of the horns on this beast from the ocean. Now there's a total of ten horns on this beast from the ocean, but the first three on its nose way over there, they get plucked up, remember? So then God refers to the last seven remaining horns and those last seven remaining horns and he ties them, he groups them, he refers to them that way because then that ties the mind into the fact that there's only seven heads showing on this beast from the land, and those seven heads from the beast from the land relate to these seven last remaining horns on the beast from the ocean. All right, does that help you a little bit? I hope so, so you can see the tie-in. So now these seven heads from the beast from the, from the land, let's go in tighter on that over here on this screen. Let's pop over there again for a tight shot. Uh, I'm just pushing those seven heads, six, those six heads off to the side because they've fallen. You know, the five of those heads are the five kings that are fallen. The sixth head was the one that is, that also now is, is fallen, Mussolini. He fell as of 1945. So when God first wrote it, he, brought, he wrote it as a prophecy. Now uh, to be fulfilled in the future. Now it's a fulfilled prophecy. The one is... He's come, he's gone. So he's part of the six heads off to the side over here. The seventh head, the big head, with the iron, you know, the, the you know, showing largely on the screen on the left side, you'll see it has ten horns on it. Now, and there's a woman sitting behind it riding this seventh head, of this, riding this beast here. Well, she's riding all seven heads, but especially this last head, she's really riding it and controlling it. And you see, it has ten horns on it. The other, the beast from the ocean, it had tens on, ten horns on it too. But these ten horns, you know, including the three that got plucked up and the last seven remaining horns, these horns are 
consecutive horns. They're 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 not all at the same time. They're they're not concurrent. In other words, they're one after another. Consecutive meaning one after another. So you got the three that came and they went, and you got the last seven. So you had Justinian in 554, and then after him, uh, whatever years that was, you had Charlemagne, and then after him, you had Otto the Great, and then after him, you had Charles IV, and then after him, you had Napoleon. After him, we had Mussolini, and then after all that, you know, after this more than 100 years recess goes by, we're going to have the seventh and last horn. That represents, that seventh and last horn represents the seventh head, this big head on this land, this beast from the land. And this seventh head of the beast from the land has ten horns on it. But these ten horns are very different than the ten horns we just showed you on the beast from the ocean because these ten horns are concurrent. In other words, not one after another, but these ten horns represent ten governments that exist at the same time. And they'll give their power to the beast, an emperor that they're going to pick and select. And that the false prophet, the representative of the Vatican, will crown in a coronation ceremony in Frankfurt, Germany, up in the, on the second floor of the Romer building in the Kaisersaal, when this thing comes into power, when the fifth seal opens up and begins. Now, on top of the horns, you may be saying, Stephen, what are those funny-looking things you put on those horns? Uh, you know, the horns that I colored a little different, the horns that were, you know, from the book of Revelation. Why have you got things that look like little toes on those horns? Well, you know, the biggest one is the big toe, and then the three middle toes, and then the little toe. Uh, I got those off this thing here if you look up you know from the statue from Daniel 2 the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream that God revealed uh, the meaning of through Daniel the ten toes represent these ten kings that exist at the end time who give their power to the beast yeah you can read that up and why Daniel 2 is important is because it shows us the two legs the two legs of iron the Roman Empire divided into the east and western division has happened and today we have the impact the effect of that with Rome and Constantinople the Constantinople being the eastern division and Rome being the western division and how the Pope has constantly gone over to the eastern division and you know played with them and you know finessed them and has already made headway into they've already made some recognition to them as long as they can keep their autonomy you see and so the eastern western divisions begin even though those ten will for a moment agree and all ten of them five from the east five from the west will agree and give their power to one 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 that they all select uh, and the god of this world is really putting that one forward and it will probably probably We've got some idea of the descendants, whom it might be, and there's some we're watching. That's a subject for another day, because that is a big subject. And we'll talk about that another time. For those of you that are interested in, hey, what all did Mr. Armstrong understand that, Stephen, you had exposure to, that if you share the details with us, we don't have all those details, and we'd like to. So, you know, that's what I'm going to do for you. Those of you that want to tune in and keep going with Friday night Bible studies, like we used to have under Mr. Herbert Armstrong, on Friday nights and sometimes it'd be different speakers but a lot of the times especially in the last several years Mr. Armstrong took those himself which was wonderful and and so those those ten toes five on the east foot and five on the west foot will are these ten horns from this beast from the ocean of uh, this I'm sorry they are the ten horns from the beast from the land uh, and they're the ten. Those ten horns are ten concurrent kings. All right, and that's this day to day. Those ten kings, we may know who some of them are. We'll find out once they give their power to the beast, and, and um, or once something happens that whittles the United States of Europe down to ten regions or with ten leaders. However, it happens. We'll probably see it as it happens, and that is going to be a colossal significant moment in time in history keep 
tuning in to worldwatch.tv every night, Sunday through Thursday. You know, watch it live or, you know, watch it from the archive, as many of you do. That's fine. Especially since I'm trying to get this software worked out, and sometimes it ain't working at airtime. And I'm asking God, please help me get that together so I can start getting on at a fixed time and stay there with it. And I know some of you have complained I'm not doing that. Well, just be patient with me. Pray for me that I can get this software and this stuff together, and uh, and we'll, we'll and, and I'll do my best. All right, we'll try to square this away and follow Mr. Exa Mr. Armstrong's example of how to do things in every way that we can here. Uh, he set a great, wonderful example for us. All right, but those ten, ten horns, same as the ten toes on the two feet of the statue with the iron legs representing the east and western divisions of the Roman Empire. And that's why I colored the, the ten horns, five of them one color and five of them another color, to represent the east and west and then put the toes up there to remind us that, look, we understand this because of what God revealed through Daniel in chapter 2 of Daniel about the, the ten toes of iron and clay, meaning iron and clay doesn't mix, you know. And the meaning, the symbol behind that for us is that they won't get along. They won't stick together, but they'll do this for a short space. They'll agree on the one they make the emperor, that beast head. And he will have power galore with all these giving their power to him for a short space of time totaling out to about three and a half years of, of great tribulation and directed and ridden as the one who rides a beast who you know like on a horse the horse rider has the reins and controls where that big powerful horse goes and this woman representing a church you know representing the Vatican and its representative the Pope who the last one will be called the false prophet. It will control that dreadful and terrible beast with the iron teeth. All right, brethren, with that, do you think, did I do well on that for you? Did I tie that together and show you how these two beasts relate? And, and, and again, just summarizing a little bit, how that beast from the ocean, the seven heads on it go all the way back to King Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean Empire, the, the, the lion's head, uh, the bear, the Persian Empire, the four leopard heads, the uh, Alexander and his four generals with the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and then the great and dreadful head on the top uh, representing the Roman Empire, and with the horns representing the first three that were plucked up, and then the last remaining seven representing the governments from Justinian, through Napoleon for the 1260-year continuous reign and the sixth one, Mussolini, for his short space during Mr. Armstrong's prime time and the seventh one for our time, the one that is yet to come. And then those seven remaining heads representing over here on this other beast from the land now, those seven horns representing and being the same as the seven heads, the last seven horns of that beast from the ocean being the same as the seven heads on this beast from the from the sea. And of course, I got them right here too. And then I, maybe this, maybe this chart. Let's see which button brings up that. Uh, we're on this old system, so this old system, this button right here should bring that one forward. It does. So as you can see on the bottom, the the beast from the ocean. The last seven horns, I've got them tied with smoke going up to the seven heads of the beast from the land. So the last seven horns on the beast from the ocean, from its seven head, are the same as the last seven horns are the same as the seven heads on the beast from the land. And then the seventh head on the beast from the land has ten horns that are ten concurrent leaders for our modern day today and then the woman on the back of that seventh head will be the pope and that seventh head will be the beast and there will be ten concurrent leaders over regions or nations that are part of the united states of europe and they will fulfill very early on they will fulfill um, ezekiel 6 6 where god says 
uh, sons of Joseph, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States. If you don't clean up your act, if you don't stop disobeying me, all of your cities will be laid waste. And that's what this, that's what this uh, beast on top, the beast from the land, the seventh head, uh, that's what he'll do. He'll, he'll load up the nukes, he'll load up the missiles they have in Europe with the nukes. Probably many of those nukes are ones made in America. Uh, the, and they'll just send them back to us. They'll say, hey, these belong to you. Let's send them back to you. But they'll be cocked and loaded. And and they'll send them to you guys in the United Kingdom first. You have the preeminence over Manasseh. You get it first. Uh, God's going to let you have it first. All of your cities laid waste. And then later that same day or the next day, all of the cities of the United States get laid waste. Now, how can I tell you that? I'm simply doing what God tells his ministry to do in Titus 1, verse 7, and that is to teach as you were taught. That is what God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong taught us, that United Kingdom, you get it first. When the, as soon as the beast comes in power, when that fifth seal opens up, one of the first things he's going to do is, bam, boom, all the cities of the United Kingdom, and later that same day or the next day, all of the cities of the United States, boom, boom, boom. He's going to knock out the two allies that helped defeat him, the beast, you know, the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. They helped beat, you know, that thing that was going to be the Third Reich. Uh, so that in the Fourth Reich, they think we're now we'll we'll we're going to dominate the world, and God allows them to do that for a short space of time, about three and a half years, and. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 41, tells us that he dominates the whole world. Even Egypt is not outside his grip. He's got them, too. He, as the king of the north, he knocks out the king of the south and gains dominion over the whole world, and except for one little place. And that one little place, let me come over here and let's pop that up on the screen for a moment. That one little place is described in Daniel 11, verse 41, as the land of the children of Ammon up there in the north, Moab just south of that, below that, and then at the very bottom down there, the land of the children of, 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 of Edom. And um, at the south entranceway to that whole area, just in the suburb, southern suburb of Edom, is that mountain way that where Petra is located, and uh, part of the Edomite area. And it's how you enter into that area from the west, from from where uh, modern-day nation of Israel is now. So if God causes us to be flown into Tel Aviv, let's say, on the wings of the two wings of a great eagle, and that's a symbol. I'll put the scripture up for you in a moment. That's a symbol of uh, could be jet air aircraft. It could be chariots of fire. It could be, it could be actual eagles. You know the very the term that God used for the beast that He prepared to swallow up Jonah, He called a great fish, and He's using similar terminology when He talks about what we're going to travel on. Uh, those who are counted worthy to escape, when He says a great eagle the two wings of a great eagle. So it could be a literal great eagle. You actually see legal eagles uh, grabbing up animals. They have pictures and videos of that now today. You can take a look at it on YouTube. Um, all right, but however it's done, and it could well be jet aircraft, because, you know, a lot of things in Revelation are symbol. And two wings, great eagle, that could mean a great um a jumbo jet of some kind that's rounding up God's people when we're in trouble and those accounted worthy. However God does it, we'll we'll find out and we can tell you after he's done it. And you'll maybe, you know, as it's being told you, hey, you're accounted worthy, go. Now's the moment. And here's how you go and maybe the eagle's in your backyard, maybe it's a plane down you know, down the street. Maybe we're all assembled somewhere together somehow. But at that moment We'll know. Those who are accounted worthy, God will let you know. He will gather us up. He'll gather you up if you're supposed to go. All right, now, 
I think I, that's a hopefully that's an encouraging way to uh, to wrap up this tonight, brethren. Let me see. What else should I show you? Oh, the scriptures. Uh, yeah, thank you. I wanted to show you the uh, the scriptures. I hope they're going to fit the screen somehow. Oh, I wonder why they're not fitting. Uh, the the video we showed you by Mr. Armstrong was a different width, and so yeah, yeah some of this is going to get clipped off, but at least this will give you a little idea. I was just saying that you know we go on two wings of a great eagle. That's from Revelation 12, verse 14, and um, to the woman we're given two wings. It's kind of cut off up here, but two wings is what that's saying of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Well, you know what? If I bring, not even if I bring that out, it's going to be cut off. Um, bear with me a second. I'm going to bring it out. And let me see if I can make an on-air live adjustment for you. I think I can. Just bear with me a second. These we're going to. We're, I'm just going to show you three scriptures, and we're going to wrap it up for tonight, brethren. Right after that, I think this is important for you to be able to see all of this. All right, I got the left side ready. Let's get the right side ready. Put the left foot in, the right foot in, and shimmy around, do the hokey pokey. No, this is serious stuff. Okay, got it. Now I think you can see the whole the whole scripture. Yeah, and to the woman. A woman in scripture means a church, and in this case it means the true church, and it means the portion of the true church who followed what Christ told us to do in Luke 21, 36, to be watching daily the events of of the world in the news that relate to the seals the first four seals the only ones the only ones of the seals that are active now are the first four so that we can be accounted worthy to escape the last three is what christ is saying there and, and to be worthy to stand before the son of man we should be doing that and if we fall short on that the only way we're going to get to stand before the son of man is to as left behind as lukewarm is to follow what Christ says do in Revelation 3 verse 18 to buy of me gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom that's what God's end time apostle has explained that verse to mean in Revelation 3 18 I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire the fire is the fiery trial of martyrdom and that martyrdom begins after the fifth seal is opened up and that's the same time the Laodicean era begins according to God's end time apostle. I'm not making up anything new, brethren. I'm I'm following I'm teaching you as we were taught. And there's nobody that has the power to make new doctrine. That was a doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. It also means teaching with authority. That was a doctrine that God's end time apostle left with us. Oh, but he died, some will say. Even some ministers who were close to him say, yeah, Stephen C., but he died. Yeah, well, so did Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Bartholomew, all the Old Testament prophets. They all died. So what are we going to do? Toss this book out the window or tear out the pages of all those who died? you got nothing left. Um uh, and the inspired words of God's end-time apostle are backed up and supported by Scripture where in Revelation 3, God describes in nine verses what the Laodicean era is and when it is. Let's go there for real quick and we'll conclude with this. The reason I'm doing this is because there are so many teaching this falsely, teaching this contrary to how God taught us, taught it to us through his end-time apostle. As some of you out there who try are trying to get away from God's end-time apostle, and you're putting yourself out in a boat all by yourself, oh yeah, you got some ministers around you supporting that idea, and, and different teachings, well, this other guy over here, he teaches that, you know. You're, you're isolating yourself, you're, you're getting yourself into what God's end-time apostle said, well, man who isolates himself I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for him he puts himself in trouble um, you, and you got to stay rightly discerning the scripture and God did that for us through Mr. Armstrong we simply have to do like the Bereans did and prove it but through the guidance of the apostle because God gave it to us through his apostle he, none of us put this 
puzzle together by ourselves. You know, God had it so that we would have to look to his apostles. It, just like the people of Israel, he had them looking to Moses. They were supposed to. And when they didn't, through Korah and others, they run off on their own, tried to, we're going to go ahead and take that promised land, not wait 40 years in the desert. They all got in big trouble. They all, they wind up dying and not making their gold. And so you need to stay with God's apostle. Here's what happens in when the Laodicean era is. There's only nine verses that describe it. It starts in verse 14 of Revelation 3. He says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans. And then he describes the attitude. They're neither hot or cold. And he hates that. I'll lukewarm. I'll spew you out because of it. Because you, and you say, you think you got it. Because you're, you are God's church. And you're keeping his Sabbaths, both weekly and annual. And so you say, I'm rich, increased with goods. I have need of nothing. Boy, I got it. I understand it. I don't even need to Herbert Armstrong. I can kind of make, I can kind of fly this on the wind as long as I'm reading the scriptures, you see. I, I can figure this out. No, you can't. You're going to get yourself off in a whole pack of trouble because you're really missing the boat, especially if you miss the center verse. There's four verses before verse 18, four verses after verse 18. God put it right in the center for a reason. The central point of the of the Laodicean era is he tells you that once it begins, after the beast has come on the scene and the great tribulation has started, he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, the fiery trial of martyrdom, that you may be rich. Because he says, you think you are, but you really you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's God's evaluation of those of you who think, oh, we got it. And a lot of you have studied a lot, and you know more than maybe a lot of Philadelphians know without, you know, looking at notes in their Bible. Because you've got it in here, see, and you talk about it. But you're, sometimes you're talking about it wrong if you're not following Mr. You, Mr. Armstrong, God's end-time apostle, who set doctrine on this. And it, the doctrine is provable by Scripture. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. There's no martyrdom going on now. There's no beast. And the beast is going to make this possible for those who thought they were hot shots and got left behind. And one reason they're lukewarm is because they're not doing everything Christ said do, especially this verse. Let me pop this up on the screen. We'll come back to pray that your flight be not in the winter. That's important. But let's see if I can get this in a way that you can see the whole scripture, get the Lord third out of your way. Luke 21, 36, Christ telling us, watch you therefore and pray always. And if you put the word so in here so you can understand the meaning of that, he's not saying pray that you can be accounted worthy to escape, although there would definitely be nothing wrong with asking him, God, you know, Account me worthy to escape. What you're asking for if you do that is for God to spank you into shape if you're not watching and praying always about what you're supposed to be watching. What you're supposed to be watching is the things he was just describing in the earlier part of this same chapter, Luke 21, where he's explaining in plain language the seals of Revelation. There's only four of them you can watch. Only four of them are active. The first four. And so he's saying, watch those. And why does he have the word therefore in there? Well, I don't have it here to put on the screen for you, but if we back up in our Bibles, one verse to verse 35 of Luke 21, it, right there Christ is explaining that the great tribulation comes as a snare upon the whole world. And as he puts it there, he says, it comes as a snare upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. In, in other words, it comes like a surprise, a thief in the night, a... Uh, to the whole world, including brethren, if you're not watching, so that you you see that, wow, this thing is shaped to snap any moment. The cheese is loaded, the bait's loaded on the mousetrap, and it's about to be triggered. Boom! <coughs> and if you don't get yourself out of the way of that blade, it's going to have you in it. And you get yourself out of the way of that blade of a mousetrap by watching and praying always always meaning all the time with all your heart soul might and mind about the things that are affecting people around the world from false religion and the sword war and rumors of war and the uniting of europe and famine and pestilence and trouble 
and earthquakes, you know, people dying from those things, and you watch those, and you pray about the ones affected, and and you'll know what to say if you're starting to do the praying always. God will even help you. He'll give it to you. He'll put the feeling and the emotion in there for you as you stay on your knees and do it. You know, when Mr. Armstrong set us an example of telling us, you know, hey, brethren, you should pray so much every day, you know, like maybe a half hour every day. There was something to that. As you do that, even though that's mechanical, and some people complained about that, there's another thing you can complain about. If you want to be a, a gossiper, a murmurer out there like the ancient Israelites were, which God hates, Moses hated hearing it, Mr. Armstrong hated hearing it, but he would. He'd hear it from people. You know, oh, that's rote. You know, that's praying a half hour every day, you know, in the morning and then later and several times. Why? That's mechanical. Yeah, but you can learn something by doing that. Stay on your knees. Sometimes stay on there for an hour. And you'll learn You'll learn how to communicate with God. You'll learn how to pray. You'll learn how to have the heart of God, the kind of heart that God loved in David, a man after my own heart. He wants to see more Davids, more of us with that heart after God, David style. And, uh, you know, so... Even if it's not exactly a half hour, but if you get close to it and you find sometimes, hey, I'm starting to go over that. Bingo, you're getting it. And you're going to be accounted worthy to escape. Because God's writing your name in a book when you do this every day. That you, and so watch and pray always about these things related to the first four seals. We help you with the watching with World Watch Sunday through Thursday night. We sum up the day for you with the most pertinent things that relate to the seals that you should be watching. I spend the day digging those out. Sometimes I have to really hustle because I'm still wrestling with the software and I have other things I'm trying to take care of in the studio to keep it maintained and the roof up above it and you know everything else all of you all of you have to do too to you know to live as humans in this world and eat and feed your face and but I summarize it for you, but I can't do your prayer for you. If you're not doing that, if I'm not doing mine, I'm in the same boat with you, brother. And if I'm not doing my prayers, God will leave me behind, too. And then, uh, then we'll ha I'll have to do what Christ says do in Revelation 3.18. At that time, once the Great Tribulation has begun, the beast is here, I'll have to submit to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the beast gives those who are left behind an opportunity to fulfill Revelation 3.18, where God says, I, I counsel you to buy of me gold right in the fire. The beast will put it right in front of you. All you got to do is endure to the end, and keeping the Sabbath without compromise, the beast will kill you. And there you are. You've been able to buy the gold tried in fire by just refusing to work on the Sabbath, refusing to bow down to the image of the beast. And... Um, and so he says, um, if you do this, you can be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. We're talking about the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal now. So watch the first four that are active to be accounted worthy to escape the last three. The fifth, the Great Tribulation, the worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world at this time coming, no nor ever after. And escape the seventh seal with God pouring out his wrath during the last year of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation will last three and a half years. The bulk of it will be during the first two, two and a half years. And then the heavenly signs will tell you, we're two and a half years into this mess. Now begins, after the sealing of the 144,000, begins the year-long day of the Lord. God pouring out his wrath on those who took the mark of the beast, who either worked on the Sabbath or worshipped the image of the beast or both and uh, and, uh, and and to stand before the son of man that means you know first resurrection for those of us that are called to the spring harvest and God has it in the order chronologically of its happening you get to you know you be accounted worthy to escape first now if you're not counted worthy to escape you're not going to be worthy to stand before the son of man unless you buy of God gold tried in the fire fiery trial of martyrdom that's it, because you, you fell short. Even though you were keeping the Sabbath and the Holy Days, you fell short if you weren't following all of Christ's instruction, which especially includes this, what he said in this verse, Luke 21, 36. Watch the four seals that are active now, because it, it, because it comes as a snare on the world if you're not watching, 
That's the therefore. And pray always. And by doing this, the watching and the praying always, so that you may be accounted worthy to escape the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, all the things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the man, Son of Man in the, in the first resurrection. All right, brethren, I'm going to come back out with you, and we're going to try to wrap it up. I said I did have one other verse. I was just going to show you that part of our praying, Christ gave us instruction in Matthew 24, verse 20, talking just before explaining the great tribulation coming and being the greatest time of trouble ever you know he he's referencing in this verse he's referencing back to luke 21 36 where he said pray always and watch so that you can be accounted worthy to escape and he's saying here pray part of your praying should include these words pray that your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath day and you know why that's very important to us right now at this very moment, brethren? Because things are so ripe on the world scene. Uh, these, these seals from Revelation are so blossoming and blooming. It's like the analogy Christ made that where he said, uh, when you see the fig tree or all the trees, then the limbs on those trees become tender and the little buds begin to blossom. You know that summer is nigh, summer's near. And then he said, to make it as if it were an analogy or a contrast, he said, likewise, when you see all these things begin to happen, and begin to become more frequent, more intense, more devastating, these first four seals, know that the kingdom of God is near. How near? There is, from the time that fifth seal opens up, three and a half years is the countdown clock to the seventh trump of the seventh seal when Christ returns. So know that that last three and a half years is about to crack, about to burst open when these first four are blossoming. And brethren, if you're watching the news with us every night, you will see those things are indeed blossoming. And so this could happen anytime. This fifth seal. And some of you are going to get caught short if you don't pull your snack together real quick and start watching and praying always about these things. Tune, tune in with us Sunday through Thursday night on worldwatch.tv. We run that live on Facebook Live for now, too. I'm having to pay them advertising. Some of you, see, you say, I hate those when they say sponsor by them. Well, I hate having to pay those sponsorships. But guess what? If we don't, they just take us out of the news feed, and you won't even know we're there. So, and, and they're cheaper than some other sources I might pay that produce a good live stream the way Facebook does. So, you know, it's been, it's been, I think it's worth the bucks. Buy the truth, sell it not, share it with your brethren. And uh, brethren, that's it. We're out of time. I went over time. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I went over time for this Friday night Bible study. Um, and so... Um, Let's get a good night's sleep with what's left. I'm going to sign right off. Thanks for joining me tonight. We'll be back. God willing, we'll be back during the daytime portion of the Sabbath. It'll still be the 22nd day of the 8th month because the 22nd day of the 8th month began at sunset tonight on Friday on the Roman calendar. Uh, but it stays the 22nd through the night, even after midnight and into the daylight hours of tomorrow on God's Hebrew calendar, this God's sacred calendar as we refer to it. Uh, but we will change this part on the on the right side of the lower third that says Friday night, 10th of November. It'll become Saturday morning, the 11th of November. Man is so dumb. He created a calendar trying to change times and seasons where he begins the days in the middle of the night, at midnight. Strange. We will not be doing that in the world tomorrow. We will be going back to the calendar you see referenced on the left side of the bottom of your screen in the lower third. You know, we'll be calling this the 28th, the 22nd day of the eighth month from sunset of the, after the sixth day has ended until sunset at the end of the Sabbath. That will all still be the same date on God's calendar, and it will all still be called Sabbath. Right now we're in the eve of the Sabbath, and tomorrow we'll be in the daylight portion of the Sabbath. All right, brother, have a good night's sleep since we're in the eve portion. I better get out of here. And uh, 
and thanks for joining me and i tell you what i'll do i'll pull up this screen that's got that verse pray that your flight be not in the winter because brethren if we're not praying that god could let this thing snap together this winter and it, it, there and this week the last few days have turned cold here in alabama where i am i definitely wouldn't want to have to be outside overnight trying to escape in this kind of cold weather so look can i put this up leave this with you as we sign off as a good encouragement to do to follow this instruction of jesus christ that we pray our flight be not in the winter let's pray that tonight before we go to bed we don't want to be waking up by some angel saying there's an eagle out in your backyard with two great wings and go out there and get on it. Well, it's cold. Well, you didn't pray that your flight be not in the winter, so we're going now. So, brethren, let's do that, will you? And I'll see you during the daylight portion of this Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Shalom. Manana. So that's not manana. That means tomorrow. I'll see you during the daylight portion of, of the Sabbath. Good night.